they are characterized by robust um, power laws in correlation functions. And we want to understand how these occur. And uh, the sort of the proposal made by Pierre Bach was that many natural systems many natural driven dissipative systems <coughs> with threshold dynamics <coughs> steady states having burst like relaxations with uh, events of all sizes. Power law correlations. And this is the SOC hypothesis. So let us just go through this because this is the main point of the whole um, talk. So, uh, lectures. So these are natural, many natural systems driven dissipative. So these are not equilibrium systems. These stuff are driven from outside with some influx and uh, they have under, they have dissipation. So laws of the equilibrium thermodynamics, et cetera, are not going to work explicitly. And uh, typically we work with threshold dynamics. Maybe I should put this like this. Maybe you can imagine systems which don't have threshold dynamics, which also show SOC, but we will typically work with systems which do have threshold dynamics and show SOC. And uh, then they show steady states, and then they have these burst like relaxations. Means I drew a picture which was. This was time, and I forgot this axis. It was some activity of some sort. Just one second. Let me finish my sentence. Let I'll use. Okay. So this was some activity, and many systems show this kind of behavior. And these are the ones we are going to describe. Yes, sir. Threshold, threshold dynamics is something doesn't happen unless a threshold is crossed. If you apply a perturbation, a small perturbation doesn't cause any effect. But if you apply a big enough perturbation, then something happens. So that is the, the model which we discussed last time was this sand pile model where unless the height becomes more than something, nothing happens. So in these systems, you know, there are two kinds of systems. One is called linear response, where you apply a little bit of perturbation and a little bit of response occurs. And these are non-linear response. If you apply a little bit of perturbation, nothing happens. Only when the perturbation exceeds some value will a response occur. Okay, so threshold dynamics is very important in generating these kinds of events. Okay, um, so then we discussed this BTW model of sand piles which you will recall, model of sand piles. 
So, there was a square lattice and uh, on each side you could have some grains which could be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 and uh, the rule was that you should imagine that you, the grains sit on top of each other. But if you try to put too many grains on top of each other, the pile is unstable and it cannot stay and it topples. And so, it said that in our case, we said if more than three particles, then it topples and four particles leave the system, one to each neighbor. And then if something topples at the boundary, then some particles leave the system. Now, you keep on adding particles one by one at a randomly chosen site, then relax the system and then add again, then relax the system. Each time you add something, so sometimes nothing may happen, sometimes a toppling event will occur, some things will leave and then you do it again and again and there is a long time steady state. And in this steady state, you see that kind of behavior for various observables. I can see number of things leaving the system or I can look at number of events generated in the toppling, number of topplings when you add one particle and all of them will show some such behavior and then we are calling that uh, critical steady state and we want to understand the behavior. Okay, so this is what we will study now, uh, but references. The primary reference is a review article I wrote in 2006, Physica A. It has been uploaded on the uh, on the course college website and you should, uh, you know, that is a primary reference. It ref all the references cited in the end there will be the ones which are the ones I will use mainly. We will go a little bit beyond this one, but at that time maybe I will give you extra references. Otherwise, the references cited in this paper are enough for our purpose. They are too much, you know. They are, some 80, 100 references. Mm, I don't expect you to read all of them in the next two weeks, but if you happen to um, look at the problem further, then you can perhaps have to look at them. Okay. All right. So, this was the model which we defined. So, what one can do is that one can define such a model where we said the critical height is 3, but I can think of a different model where the critical height is not 3, it is 7. It turns out, you had some question? Okay, what do you mean by steady state? Very good. Uh, so, no, I will uh, try to explain what is meant by steady state. So, what happens is we have some system or the other. Uh, I show it like this. I have some input which I put in and then something happens, some relaxation happens inside and then I can watch the properties of the system later and see what happens. I can monitor some behavior and I will find some output. So, for example, I can take a piece of metal and I put it in sunlight and I measure the temperature as a function of time. So, what will I see? I will see temperature as a function of time. Uh, so, let me just to be sure that we are mm, talking there is a thin sheet of metal or it can be glass, I put it in sunlight and the thermometer is placed somewhere such that whether you put it here or here or here, it does not make a difference, you get the same measurement and I measure the temperature as a function of time. I might get a graph like this. So, there is a, after some time the temperature does not change much and that is the steady state. Steady state is one in which when you observe on a macroscopic scale, 
you do not see any noticeable variation in properties. Okay. And uh, so, in my senpai, for example, I can start with um, some part, maybe empty or some particles, and I keep on adding particles. And I may mo monitor the total mass in the pi as a function of time. So, what I will find is that initially the mass generally rises. But after some time, it becomes kind of steady and does not increase much on the average. It shows tiny fluctuations, but the mean does not increase. So, we will say this part is the steady state. And this part is called the transient state. Transient is the one which dies away after some time. Then, of course, there is a quibble about when is steady state reached. And we will just say we wait long enough so that we do not see any difference. Okay? Yes. Okay, so for us, the notion of equilibrium is defined by a, in a very narrow way. Equilibrium systems are systems where equilibrium statmec works, by which is meant, what is equilibrium statmec? There is a Hamiltonian which is defined for the system. If you look at an isolated system with a given energy, all configurations with same energy occur equally likely, that is the microcanonical ensemble. And using this ensemble, you can predict all kinds of properties of the system. What is the color of the system? What is the um, mean energy, mean temperature or I do not know, um, all other properties. What is the susceptibility? What is the magnetization? So, whenever these prescriptions work, that is called equilibrium statement, that is called in equilibrium. Okay? However, if you have systems in which there are external fluxes, like as I said, there is I shine light, and uh, I guess there is a steady state, so some energy comes in, some energy must be going out, so there must be some scattered light, maybe not at the same frequency, maybe at a different frequency or whatever. I do not know all these details, but there is a notion of a steady state. This system there is not an equilibrium state of matter because the laws of equilibrium thermodynamics do not apply to metal sheets put in sunlight. Okay? So, that is the sense. We are using a steady state as a more general notion than an equilibrium state. And typically in this system, there is no Hamiltonian you can write down, which will describe the steady state behavior. Okay, all right. Okay, so uh, okay, so we have. I was saying that cons you can take a different model in which. So we had a in the BTW model ZC, which was the critical value of Z was three, and instability occurs if Z is bigger than ZC. But suppose I work with Z c equal to 5, then what happens? The answer is nothing changes, it is all the same. What happens is, after some time, the pile will uh, get height, any site you observe will have some height. Once it becomes 5, then it decreases. Two, four particles are lost. Sorry, Z c is 5, so 5 is stable, 6 is unstable. So, when you start with 6, then it goes to 2. Then you add 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 is unstable, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 is unstable. So, at the site, the allowed values of height are only 2, 3, 4, 5. In the original model, the height at the site was 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 was unstable. So, it does not matter. All you have, the allowed heights are maximum and 3 less and no other. 
So, you can if I work out the problem with z c equal to 3, I can also work out with z c equal to 6. Yes, sir. Yes, of course. And is it obvious to have detailed balance in the entire scale? And no. It is, it, the detailed balance condition is not satisfied. In, in all the cases, or uh, when you have a steady state in time, whatever detail is balanced will never hold? Or? So, I can have a state which is called 0, 0, and you can go to a state which is called 0, 1. And I'm not sure how I go from one zero to zero zero because we are allowed to add particles, but we are not allowed to remove particles. Okay. So detail balance does not work in our problem. Okay. Okay. So so this point is clear. Then we can make some other changes, and so one can actually work with a more general model. So, let me work here. Yes. Yeah, so the rules are the same. Every time a toppling occurs, four particles leave one to each neighbor. Okay. okay, that is the rule. So even if Zc is six, four particles leave one to each neighbor. That okay. is that is how we are defining it. Okay, so I can define a more general sand pile. So, you can take any graph you like. There are nodes, and we say that zi is equal to height at node i, which is the number of sand piles or the height of the local column of sand at the site. And this is a in number integer which is bigger than or equal to 0. And then there is a instability condition instability condition is that z is bigger than z c. Okay, and then toppling occurs. And in a toppling, site J gets uh, some number of particles, which we'll tell. It gets minus delta i j particles. So, I define a matrix delta, okay. Matrix delta is n by n matrix, n is the number of sites, uh, i is equal to 1 to n, n by n matrix. And uh, so, site i, z i goes to z i minus delta i j for, sorry, z j goes to z j minus delta i j for toppling at i. So, if I topple at site i, then all the heights at all the sites are updated and the height at z j becomes z j minus delta i j and delta i j is a specified matrix. 
given. That is the rule. Once I give you the matrix delta, then the and I give you these values z c, then everything is good. But we can choose without loss of generality. Generality delta i i equal to z c plus one. Okay, so in my problem, my graph was just a square lattice, and uh, this delta i i is four. The site where the toppling occurs, four particles are lost, and each neighbor gets one. So delta j i j will be one. For sites which are, um, uh, sorry, yeah, delta ij will be minus one for the neighbor sites and zero for all other sites. Okay, so this is um, this is all. But this matrix delta has to have some good behavior properties. So requirements for delta. Well, we should have delta i i greater than zero. The point is this: there is an unstable site. Now, after toppling, the height is going to become delta i i minus j minus delta i i. So, unless delta i i is positive, you will still be unstable, and it will keep on becoming more unstable or equally unstable, and that is no good. So, delta i i should be bigger than zero, so that the height decreases; it becomes less unstable. Okay, so that is the first condition. The second condition is that delta i j is less than zero for j not equal to i. By which is meant that sites other than the site where you are toppling, the height there can only increase because some particles go there. It cannot decrease. Okay. So less than or equal to zero. And the third condition is that summation over delta i j over j is greater than or equal to zero. Now delta i i is the number of particles which uh, leave, and delta i j minus delta i j is number of particles which read j. So the number of particles which leave should be more than equal to the number of particles which reach the other sites, because some particles may leave the system that we allow, and so this should be true. There is no particle creation in the toppling process. That is the meaning of this equation. Okay, no particle creation during toppling. Sorry. Uh, above, okay. So, no particle creation in toppling. Uh, so, this one says summation over delta i j over j is greater than or equal to zero for all i. This is the third condition. And we actually need one more condition, which is that summation over i and j of delta i j is strictly greater than zero. So on each side, there may not be any loss of particles, but eventually there should be a loss of particles somewhere. Otherwise, I keep on adding particles, and there is no way they can leave. Then the number of particles will keep on increasing, and there won't be any steady state. So this is an obvious condition for the requirement of a steady state. Okay? Do I need anything else? Ah, uh, yes, of course. I need something else, which is uh, connected graph. By which is meant the following. You cannot have a situation where there is a graph like this 
and there is a graph like this. Okay, these two parts are not talking to each other. But suppose there is a site where dissipation can occur is here, but these sites cannot go there. Then even though in the full system, my condition number four is satisfied, it is not satisfied in this part, and so there won't be a steady state. Okay, so all we are trying to ensure is that whatever rules we put in should allow for a steady state to be there. And you can check that these conditions are enough to ensure the existence of a steady state. Okay, we will prove, but you should be able to convince yourself that this is true even without a proof given on the board. Okay, so now the key result which makes all these further analysis of this problem possible is called the abelian property. And the abelian property is uh, rather easy to derive. It says in an unstable configuration, Toplin's commute. By which is meant that you have an unstable configuration. There are two or three sites which have height more than three. Okay? So now I can topple this one or this one or that one in some order. But take any two particular sites, this one and this one, both of them have height more than three. So I can first topple this one and then this one or first topple this one and that one and the final result will be the same independent of which way you do it. Okay? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. So, in some cases, there may be particle loss. So, you know, there is no particle creation. Okay? But there may be particle loss. Yeah. Yeah. Because if at all sites the sum is zero, then you can lose anywhere and then they cannot be a steady state. There have to be some boundary sites where the loss of particles can occur. Okay? For a general graph, I do not define a boundary site, I just say at some site or the other, the inequality should hold. Okay. So, so two toplings commute and then if I have some site, so this proof is all clear. If so, here is my configuration. Here is a site four. Here is a site with height five. I topple here. I will decrease this by four, and send one particle to each neighbor. I'll decrease this by four, send one particle to each neighbor. Clearly, it doesn't matter in which order I do this. Okay? If these sites are edges sent to each other, that's slightly more tricky. But it's easy to convince yourself that even then it doesn't matter in which you order you topple them and then it's true. Okay? So now we take this condition and we have a stronger result. So we say that if you take a system like this, which has several unstable sites, this one is five, this is four, this is four, this is four. Now, you topple anything in any order and you will get the same result in the end. The final con stable configuration will be the same whichever order you topple in. The proof 
is a repeated use of the previous lemma, two toppling commute. So if I produce toppling in this way, by some way t1, t7, t8, t19, I topple one and say, topple seven side, eight side, 19 side, and so on. And in the second one, I topple in some other order. But I have said that sometime or the other, t1 must occur here in the second sequence because the site is unstable and other particles can only add to it. So this t, just for, let me finish the argument, t1 will occur somewhere. But these topplings commute, so I can pretend that this t1 occur, you know, I commute it across this sequence and it will occur in the beginning and then I look at the rest of the sequence and at induction says that it will happen for everything. Okay, now there was a question. Yes. Yes. No, no, no. All the unstable sites. All the unstable sites you can topple in any order, and you will get the same result. Okay. Uh, I think uh, if and there and there is five in one side, hmm. you can topple. Hmm. If it's four, it cannot. Since it should reach five, then. No, so in our case, let us stick to this convention. The stable heights are 0, 1, 2, 3. 4 is unstable. So, okay, 4 is unstable. That was my rule. But whatever you said continues to hold even in this convention. Okay? Okay. So now, um, yes? Of course, no. So I, uh, so there have been a lot of sand pile models proposed in literature. For example, there is a model in which which is called the Zhang model, where you add something, and all the height is distributed equally amongst all the neighbors, and the height becomes zero. It is easy to check that even with a pile with two sides, this model is not abelian. There is another model in which the toppling condition depends on slopes and not on heights. Okay, so what can happen is that if you topple this side, you cannot topple this side because the condition for stability is now modified. Suppose the condition of stability is a slope condition, it says the height difference should be bigger than something. And you topple here, then it adds something here, and this height difference is no longer bigger, then you cannot topple at the second side. And so the mm, abelian property is not a generic property which is obviously true for all models. In fact, it is not true for most mm, sand pile models and most other models of self-organized criticality as well. Yes, sir. Sorry, I yes. Ah, because sometimes what can happen is that this site four is unstable. But its neighbor was also unstable, and I toppled this one first, and then this becomes 5. It is not stable, but I have in the middle of the um, toppling process, there may be sites which get more height than 4 because I didn't manage to topple them. Okay? Okay, so very good. So now, one more step is that now I can do the following. Uh, here is my pile and I add a particle here and let us say it becomes unstable. Then I can topple it and relax, but maybe I, then I add another particle here, okay? But then I can do it the other way. I first add this one and then add this one and relax and don't look at this one for a while and then do it again. So. The addition of particles is also commuting with the toppling process because addition only adds to height and it does not change the stability condition. It does not make stable heights, sorry, it does not make unstable part, sites stable. Okay? So then it follows that you can take any configuration C, you add a particle at I, add a particle at J and relax or you do it in the reverse order and relax 
and you get the same configuration in the end. Okay, so, that is the um, final result which says that starting configuration is C So, C you can add at i and relax it goes to C 1 and then you add at j and it goes to C 2, but you can do in the other order you can add at j it will give to some other configuration, but now you add at i you will get back to the same configuration. Which order you add particles does not matter, you will get the same result if you relax everything. And this is true for all starting configurations. Yes? Yes. Uh, firstly, the proof is rather, you know, there is a proof, I gave it of course, but you should now imagine that you are a high school student and you have to construct the proof yourself and you can do it. Nothing more than addition of integers is involved in the proof and you should be able to get the result once the statement is given. Okay? So, the proof said that I do not want to repeat the proof. I am sure you will be able to construct the proof yourself. It is not a difficult proof once the basic point is known. Okay, yes. But this uh, little variability with uh, Arbin particles. Yes. You said before that uh, Arbin particle is commuting with the uh, uh, Laplace link. Hmm. So can we add all particles and then calculate all the properties? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do that clearly. Okay. So, now we just want to formalize this result a little bit. So, define an addition operator. A sub i is equal to add at site i and relax. Okay. So, if you have a configuration C and you add at site i and relax, this configuration is called C prime that is the definition of the operator A. Okay? Yes? Yes, yes. Just one. No, all of them have to be reach a stable configuration. Relax as long as you need it until you reach a stable configuration and then look. C prime is the final stable configuration once you add at site i to C and relax. Okay. So, what are the allowed configurations C which are stable allowed configurations? At each site, let us take with the square lattice L by L. So, the number of configurations allowed is 4 to the power L square. Okay. Number of stable configurations. Okay. So, I can think of this A i is in um, 4 to the power L square, uh, 4 to the power L squared cross 4 to the power L squared matrix. It looks like this. So, C is a configuration C 1, C 2, C 3 you make a list of these 4 to the power L squared configurations and this matrix will be some matrix like 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. 
it takes this configuration, takes it to that one, and this one goes to that one. Okay. Yes. C is a stable configuration. C is a stable configuration. A is a matrix which applied to a stable configuration gives you another stable configuration. It will have exactly one one somewhere and zero everywhere else. Yes. C's don't form any groups. C's are the configurations. So These are the vectors. A. The A's. We are getting there. Okay. Okay. So what we have proved, we have shown or argued that A I C A J is equal to A J A I A J C for all i j c yes sorry uh, why the i f i matrix is uh, uh, four times four square n square like ah because, because each side can take four possible heights 0 1 2 3 in a stable configuration and there are L squared possible choices because I am working on an L by L square. So, so in uh, each, let's say, um, configuration vector, hmm. there is only one element which is one and the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Because that's right. It should be much like. No, no, no. So that's uh, that's all. The, the vectors are zero, 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 one in one place and zero, zero, zero. And this matrix applied on them gives you another such vector. Okay, and now the claim is that this now equation can be written as a j a i commutator equal to zero because these are just matrices. No, I don't worry about c because it is true for all c. Okay, so this is called the abelian property. The key point here is that actually in the proof somewhere we involved the looking inside the ever in relaxation process what happens when you topple. But now the A's don't look at that toppling. They just look at a stable configuration goes to another stable configuration. Okay. We don't see what happens inside. Okay. All right. So this is the basic abelian property. But what can I learn from this one? Well, uh, just one second. Ah, very good. So now, starting with this result, one can get some non-trivial results with rather easily. Okay, so firstly, um, yeah, so Suppose I start with some configuration C and I apply the addition operator at site I. So I get to another configuration. By applying with AI, I get C1. Then I can apply A1 again on this one. I get C2. Then apply A1 again on this one. I get C3 and keep on doing this. So what will happen? Well, the space of allowed configurations is only finite. So it eventually, this thing will come back on itself, and it might do something like this. Okay. So what happens is that if you keep on applying, it'll go, and then after some period t, it'll come back to C3, and then it'll, you know it's just a periodic repetition of the same thing. Okay. But it is possible that in this process, I have not exhausted all possible configurations. So I can take another configuration, which is not in this set, and that will go like this. And it will also form its own loop. 
and another one which may merge with this one and so on. Okay. So, finally, the set of configurations will have the cyclic states and non cyclic states, states which are in the cycle and states which are outside the cycle. And the obvious result is that at long times all the non cyclic states occur with zero probability. Because you know, sometime or the other, if you are here, then sometime or the other you will apply A1, but you can never get back to C2 once you have gone to C3 by applying A1. Okay, maybe by applying some other operator you could get there. Okay. So, so let us see what happens if I take this state and I apply A2, some other operator, which produces a state. So, A2 can produce a state which is uh, here in the same, then it does not produce a new state, then I do not care. I want to produce a, I want to go outside this cycle. So, I go to a state A2 which produces a state here and now I want to see what is the cycle produced by A2. Okay. So, cycle produced by A2 will give you now apply A 1 here, you get here and if you apply A 1 here, you get here and the point is that if you take this state and apply A 2, you get to the same state of course, by a billion property. So, this one will go to A 3 and this will go to A 3 and there is a shift. So, the whole procedure of applying A 2 is sort of like taking this graph and shifting it together. Okay. And so, in particular, there is a result which is that all these different cycles you will produce by A 1 will have the same period. Because if I apply A 2, I eventually go to the same cycle. Let us produce a formal proof. If there is a configuration C such that A 1 to the power T C is equal to C. So, C is a cyclic state with period T. C is a cyclic state with period T. Then C prime is equal to A J C. Then A 1 to the power T C prime is equal to C prime. So, all the periods will be the same. That is a very strong result. You know, we started with the, just this phase space and saying that look eventually it will have to come back to itself, nothing else can happen. And now we are saying that okay, all the, you, you can produce all these kinds of cycles, but all of them have to have the same length. Okay. All right. So, now let us produce this picture. You have this cycle and you apply some other operator, you get another cycle. Excuse me. Just one second. <coughs> yes. But this is true only for C prime that is reachable from C. Yeah. Okay. So, I, I, I could have uh, disconnected region of states uh, that are uh, for… Uh, we will get there. No, no, no. Okay. It is, you will see the good objection. So, you can have something which is connected and this goes to this, I apply A 2 to this one. It will produce another, some similar stuff and A 2 to this one. So, now I can think of this cycle as a simple object and when I apply A 2 to it, it produces the next cycle and when I apply A 2 to it, it produces the next cycle. And, but now my argument can be repeated. You start with this cycle, it goes to this cycle, it goes to this cycle, but eventually the cycle have to reproduce, come back to themselves. Okay. So, you will have, when I take two operators A 1 and A 2, then I will produce something which is like a torus 
the two dimensional torus at best. It may be a one dimensional torus if A2 was the same as, you know, if the cycle produced by A2 was the same as the cycle produced by A1, or it will be a torus of size 2. Then I take one more variable, A3, and apply the same procedure again. Then I get another mm, torus of a bigger size, and so on. And I keep on doing this until I exhaust all the possible states. All the states which are reachable from mm, my initial state. Okay? And all of them will either be inside the cycle or will be outside. If they are not within the, this cycle, all these states, these are also transient. Because under A1, they come back to themselves. But when I apply A2, they do not come back to themselves. So the recurrent states are only the states which occur in the final torus. Okay? So that is the statement. There is no randomness. In A, there is randomness that where we put the uh, perturbation. Yeah. Apart from that, there is other, no other randomness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is the reason we have uh, fixed periods. Yeah, 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 of course. There is no stochasticity in the relaxation process. The A's are fixed operators, given that mm, my graph and given my rules of relaxation. Okay? So, so the recurrent state. has the topology of a torus what is meant by topology of a torus you have these states i construct the states these are the points and uh, join them by arrows if you can go from one to the other and the state you will get in the end will be an n-dimensional torus. That's what we said. Okay? And then, on a torus, then what happens is that from this side, there are n arrows which go in various directions. Okay? And from this side, there are n arrows go in various directions. But on a torus, all sides are equivalent. So, in the steady state, where you can choose to go this way or that way or that way, it will be the steady state will be the state which has uniform weight on all the recurrent states. Okay? In steady state, All recurrent configurations have equal weight. So there are some configurations which have zero weight in the steady state, and there are other configurations which all have equal weight in the steady state. Okay, so we have defined, I have to tell, given a configuration, is it recurrent or is it transient, but at least we know that all the recurrent configurations will have equal weight. Okay? But in addition, now I have the extra property that if you take us any site on the torus, it has only one arrow going out and it has one arrow going in. Because we constructed it by hand, you know, for each operator AI, there was a cycle. So there was one arrow coming in, one arrow going out. Okay? So then uh, you can define an A inverse operator AI inverse is well defined. <coughs> 
on the set of recurrent states. So now I have a much richer structure. I have a group because these AI operators, you can, uh, you know, you can write, you can multiply them because A1, A2, A7, A1, A3, A8 is a product of operators. It says, my C occurs here. So I apply A8, then I apply A3, then I apply A1, then I apply A7, then A2 and A1 and so on. And I want to know what is the final result. Okay. So the answer is that in this you can flip the order. You can, you know, commute these operators any way you like. And you get all the powers of A1 I will put first and powers of A2 I will put next and the powers of A3 I put next. And uh, that will give me the final state. And I can put, right now I don't need A1 inverse, no? Okay. Uh, so very good. But actually it turns out that that is not enough because there is some extra properties which these operators AI have, which makes them satisfy an algebra. So the extra property AIs have is that suppose I take a site on the lattice. This site is called 0, this site is called 1, 2, 3, 4. Then the rule is or the observation is that if you add four sites at the origin, four particles at the origin, okay, then whatever be the initial height, it will become unstable and it will topple at least once. So I just topple it once. What happens? Then one particle goes here, one goes here, one goes here, one goes here. Okay, so I get a i to the power 4, a 0 to the power 4 is equal to a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4. Adding four particles at one site is the same as adding one particle at each neighbor on any configuration. Okay, so this is my um, equation. A similar equation holds for each site. Okay, yes. I gave the proof. You start with some configuration and look at my site. It has some height. I add four more particles, one after another. I can first add them and then topple them, you know, that we have agreed. So I add them. Now the height will be more than or equal to four. So I can topple them. I topple it once only. What do I get? Is the same as you added one particle here, one here, one here, one here, acting on C. So A4 C is equal to this times C on any C, in which case I can get rid of the C. Okay, is this clear? So this is my equation and similar equations for other sides. Okay, now I have a group algebra because now I multiply all these operators and I get very high powers of A. Suppose I get a to the power 15, but then I can use these equations to reduce the 15 power to lower values. And uh, then I generate something which will then make maybe a2 becomes big, then I mm, re reduce the power of that one and so on. Okay. So let us do this once on a small size. So this is, you know, it's, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, and I write a one to the power twelve, a <coughs> two to the power seven, a three to the power eight. Okay, but a one to the power four is equal to I take four these, so you know, add here, here. You will add something here, something here, something here. Let this call a 7 and 8. This is a 7, a 4, a 2, a 8. Right? 
So, this power 12 will be broken into a 3 to the power 7, a 4 to the power 3, sorry, a 2 to the power 3, a 8 to the power 3, a 2 to the power 7, a 3 to the power 8. Then I collect powers of 2 together, a 2 to the power 10 and use the same thing. And you can see that this is actually the original toppling process. I have not done anything. Think of these as the height configuration, the powers as the height configuration. Once the powers become too big, then I reduce them using the reduction rule, which is now this operator algebra rule. Okay. Very good. So, that is all there is to operator algebra. Hmm. Okay. So, in my case, for my square lattice, so for my square lattice, the matrix delta looks like this. It is 4, 4, 4 along the diagonal. and it is minus 1, minus 1, minus 1 at the four neighbors. Okay. Uh, so, I, mm, this is sort of schematic here. There will be some minus 1s. In each row, there are four minus 1s at most. At the corners, there are fewer. So, this matrix delta is actually kind of a familiar matrix. It is called the Laplacian matrix. It is 4 in the diagonal and minus 1 at the neighbors. How many of you have seen the Laplacian matrix before? Discrete Laplacian matrix. A large number have seen it. Actually, it is about 30 percent, but okay. I think this is a good place to be familiar with it, okay, because it turns out to play an important role in what we are going to show, okay. So, so that is my Laplacian matrix. So now I wrote these rules as a i to the power delta i i is equal to product over j not equal to i a j to the power minus delta i j. Because minus delta i j were positive numbers for i not equal to j. So, this was well defined, but now since the inverses are defined, I can actually simplify this equation and write this as a i to the power delta i j, sorry, a j to the power delta i j product over j is equal to identity for all i. Okay. I am allowed to multiply by a to the power delta i j on both sides because that is now well defined and so then this equation follows. Okay? Just so that you are not scared of this, if I take a 3 by 3 board like this, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, there are 9 operators a 1, a 2, a 3 and I get a 1 to the power 4 equal to only two neighbors will come here and two particles will leave a 2, a 4. a 2 to the power 4 is equal to, this is a bit complicated. Can somebody, of one of you help me with this one? I pick one at random, no? That one. Sir, would you be able to tell me what is a 2 to the power 4 on this graph? Louder. A1, A3, A5. A3 to the power 4 equal to uh, A2, A6. I will not write all of them, no. A9 to the power 4 is equal to A6, A8. Yeah. So, these equations together. I define the group algebra for the abelian group generated by these operators. 
Okay. So that is very nice. What is the user for this? Well, the use is the following. So we have learned in some math phys course that if matrices commute, then they can be simultaneously diagonalized. Okay, so all these AI matrices, they are all commuting with each other. So I can simultaneously diagonalize all of them. Okay, so then there exists there. Ex so if phi is a simultaneous eigenvector. eigenvector of AI. AI with a bracket around it is a set of AI which are A1 to A, all of them, right? So I write AI phi is equal to AI phi. Sorry for the bad notation. This is an operator and this is an eigenvalue. This is a number and I am deliberately using some confusing notation a little bit. Okay. Then these equations now become apply on phi, they become equations for the eigenvalues themselves. Okay. So the, and then the eigenvalues AI satisfy the equations. Um, AI to the power delta IJ. Pro a j to the power delta i j product over j equal to i. Okay, but these equations are sort of messy looking equations. Can you given, suppose now I know that these a i's are complex numbers, they are not matrices. Can you solve this set of equations? I can see that if you put everything zero, that is a solution. But suppose I ask you for all possible solutions to these equations, how hard is that? Well, the answer is it is not so hard because we realize that on the set of recurrent states, AIs will be unitary operators. Okay? So they will keep the norm fixed and so the AI small a i which are the eigenvalues are e to the power i phi i, i phi j, j, phi j real. And then this set of equations becomes delta i j phi j product over sum over j is equal to twice pi m i for all i. Sorry. Yeah. What, what is the physical meaning of uh, multiplying uh, the state by a number ai in our uh, original program? Uh, state by a number. No, no, no. The AIs are some matrices. We are I forgetting the problem because No, we are not forgetting, but we will come back to it eventually. In between, I am trying to forget. I think AIs are just some matrices I want to diagonalize. Okay. So we, have, we have changed the problem to the operators. Yeah. No, no, no. So using the operators, you can get um, some information about the original problem. We will get back to the original problem. Okay. But right now, if I am not, I might be able to say that, oh, but all the AIs are operators. They have these values. The eigenvalues are these. These are the eigenvalues of operators AI. Okay. So, what does that mean? I guess 
if all, so one of the eigen, one of the solutions of these equations is all AI equal to one. The vector phi is equal to zero 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 zero. Is the steady state vector? Uh, AI acting on phi gives you phi because e to the power zero. If phi, uh, if uh, sorry. Um, Suppose there is a solution like this, there is a vector phi such that all AI acting on phi give you back the vector, then that will be the um, steady state vector. Okay? So, I want to find the eigenvectors of AI or the simultaneous eigenvectors of all AI equal to 1 or some such thing because that gives me the steady state vector in the original problem. Okay? So, so getting back, what was my original problem? So, let us define a probability vector at time t is a vector that is equal to summation over c probability of configuration c at time t Okay. We already introduced C, uh, you know there was a 2 to the power n dimensional vector like this, which was 1 if that state was there and 0 otherwise. Now, we will give a vector P 1, P 2, P 3. This is the probability that there is a vector um, configuration 1, this is the probability there is a configuration 2, there is a probability configuration 3 at time t, there is a distribution of probabilities that gives me the probability vector at time t. This probability vector evolves in time. How does it evolve? Probe t plus 1 is equal to some transition matrix times probe Okay, that is the general formalism for Markov processes. We started with a discrete space. There was a choice, you know, when I add a particle, something happens, it goes to a new state. And so, there is a transition probability to go from state C to state C prime. All that information is coded in W. W is the transition probability to go from C to C prime. And then, this probability of T plus 1 is W times probability of T from the general theory of Markov processes. There is a transition matrix, right? Everybody is familiar with this idea. Okay, very good. So, now I got to write what is W. Yes. No, no, no. Okay, very good. So, what we are saying is that we add a particle and something relaxation occurs and then I um, wait long enough and then I add another particle. So, for the given size of the system size L, all the relaxation occurs in 1 milliseconds. I am only adding a particle every second. So, I wait long enough such so that all the relaxation processes have died down by now and so I get into a new stable state and then I add a particle, I get to a new stable state and I do not see what happens inside. I just evolve using finite discrete time additions. Yes, sir. Okay, sorry. Stable state means that they are, not, are not happening any avalanches or something? Uh, yeah, all the avalanches have died down. How, how it can happen a stable state which we add something and we come back to the same configuration because we are always… No, 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 you do not come back to the same configuration. Ah, okay. But the steady state is a linear, it is a stochastic state. Uh, so, 
if you look at long time, you will find that some configurations occur with some probability, and after some time, you will again see the same thing. Okay. So this probability vector will tend to a st steady vector for large times. Like a no, it gets to a unique vector. So it says that, uh, so this, this is from the general theory of Markov chains, is that this W is a prob probability matrix. And for large times, prob T, which is a vector, tends to a unique vector, which is called prob infinity. So that's all we are saying. This is the steady state vector. Then applying W on it further, it gives you back the same vector. And we want to know what is this probe infinity vector that is the steady state vector. That is my first concern in the study of this system because we were looking at steady states of these piles. Yes, please. Uh, can you just clarify what that notation means at the top that phi equals zero? Oh, this one. It says uh, phi one equal to zero equal to phi two equal to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was given here. It aj equal to e to the power i phi j. Okay. Other question. Okay. So very good. So this is W. What is W? In terms of my operators A, W is equal to summation P i A i. Sorry. So uh, new notation. Let us consider a sand pile in which you choose to add at site i with probability p sub i. Okay? So that is the p sub i here. So let me write for a driving adding at i with probability p sub i. W is just summation P i A i because with some probability you will add A 1 and adding A 1 on this vector will give you the uh, configuration with uh, C goes to C prime. Okay? So this is my time evolution operator for the stochastic, yes please. Uh, no, it uh, mm, no, it has only n components because phi one, phi two, phi n. There is a steady state vector and which is labeled by phi one, phi two, phi n or eigenvalues of operators a i are phi i e to the power i phi i. Okay, so I'm just taking one such vector. Each choice of phi i, which is allowed, will be one vector. Okay, what choices of phi i are allowed? They have to satisfy this equation where m i's are integers because these are these equations. So, so in this case, the operators are defined in other states because before we defined the operators huh. uh, from uh, the state of the property that's there. Yes. In, in the case of phi, they are not. Uh, so, phi, no, 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 it's very good. I think the operators, maybe I should use some notation like this. A hat is the is this operator in this matrix, 4 to the power L squared times 4 to the power L squared. Then there is a vector, it has a eigenvector, which is e to the power i phi i times phi. This vector will be labeled by phi 1, phi 2, phi n. So, phi i are just labels of eigenvectors. Each phi will be phi 1, phi 2, phi n, and that will label an eigenvector in this of the big matrix. But each operator a i will have only one eigenvector? Right? No, it has a 4 to the power n eigenvectors, no? That's, uh, that's the next task. We have some operators. We can diagonalize them. Now, what do you do with all these diagonalized operators? They have so many eigenvectors, 4 to the power L squared. Okay? So, uh, so that's what we want to do. We want to um, 
get something related to the Markov matrix. And the Markov matrix is specified by this evolution operator W. W is a linear combination of the AIs. So if I have diagonalized the AIs, I have also diagonalized W, which is very good for me. Okay. All right. So W equal to PI AI. So here, how do I find the solutions of phi i? For a given choice of m i, you choose these integers m i by yourself, whatever you like. And then phi i summation over g. So now I have, I can generate as many vectors as you like because I just choose different values of m i. For each choice of m i, this is a linear coupled set of equations for phi j. Just involves the matrix inversion. So given any choice of m i, you just uh, apply delta inverse on the vector m and you get a set of phi i which gives you the eigenvector of the operators A. And different choices of M give you different eigenvectors. So I can get um, an infinity of such eigenvectors. But I only wanted 4 to the power L squared, you know, there were only that many. So how, where, what is going on? How do I get an infinite number of eigenvectors? The answer is that sometimes you can take two different M's and they will correspond to the same vector because phi j is the same as phi j plus 2 pi. There is no difference because e to the power i phi is e to the power i phi plus 2 pi. So if you change phi j by 2 pi, you do not get a new vector, you get the same eigenvalue and hence the same vector. So while it may appear that with all choices of m, I get an infinite number of distinct values. I actually do not get so many different ones. Okay. Uh, very good. Uh, then, let us see what is the time like. I have 20, no, I have less than 20 minutes. Okay, so I think we'll, um, let us not go too fast. We will stop here. But I asked yesterday for a home assignment problem, which was to find you have a square of size L by L. You add a particle at random, it does a random work and it till it leaves. And so in the process of leaving, it has some steps it takes and what is the mean number of steps taken by the worker? That was the home assignment. How many of you managed to do it? One. One? That does not sound very promising. Okay. No, 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 very good. So, the, I, mm, I expected that all of you will not be able to solve it, but I thought that at least half or 30 percent will get there. So I have to give some hint. Okay, so the hint is like this. Suppose you do the restricted problem. I add the particle at some site R. And what is the expected number of steps you need to take to exit the lattice? Okay, so let T of R. So what we this is sort of a standard random work problem. 
you imagine that the walker takes one step per unit time and t of r is the time required for it to exit that is the way it is usually posed so i will use the same notation t of r is the expected time to exit when it starts at r Okay. So, then it turns out or it is easy to see that suppose the walker is here. So, what it can it do in the next time step? It can just jump to one of the four neighbors. Then it is here. Then what is the time required to exit? It is T of R plus 1. Okay. So, with some probability that um, exit time is T of R plus E y otherwise it is this one. So, T of R is equal to 1 plus 1 by 4 summation over neighbors T of neighbor. Is this argument clear? So, now this is also the same um, del squared kind of matrix I think. So, you can solve this equation by this is a linear set of coupled equations. So, you solve it and you get T of R. Then you have to just solve it for each value of O and the, there is an initial condition T, is, T of R is equal to 0 for R on the boundary because then you do not have to do anything you know you are already there. A boundary is this outside region. Okay, and um, so if you solve for all, R, so if you start with initial condition R equal to zero here. In at originally the particle is here, then you can solve this condition equation, and you get an equation which is del square t is equal to one. Did I goof? No, I'm doing okay. Um, there is no information about R zero in this. The starting point. Um, so this equation is good, but it depends on the starting point in some way. I'm only supposed to give you a hint. No, I'm not supposed to solve the problem now. So I'm giving you a hint. There is some equation like this. Of course, it has to depend on R 0 in some way look on where you start. So, you put that in, you solve this equation and then you get the answer. Then you average that answer for all R 0 to get the final answer. Okay. So, it is a two step process. Okay. Is the hint clear? Yes, sir. Yes, please. The second step is that I will find T of R 0 for all R 0 and then I have to sum over R 0 1 by number of sites is equal to average time when you add at random. That was the original question that you know I add it at a random site. So, R 0 is also a random variable. So, I have to average over R 0. Okay. So, I think we should stop now. No, I have 15 minutes left. Okay, very good. Um, so, in the next 15 minutes, I can assign you two more homework problems. No, no, no. They are uh, problems are chosen to be instructive and not infinitely hard. And if you work them out, you will understand the next lecture a bit better. That is the aim. <laughs> okay, so problem two. 
Okay, so it says there are just these two sides. And I have a sand pile. Um, where the toppling matrix is 4, 4, minus 1, minus 1. So, if the height is more than 3, a toppling occurs here and 3 particles leave and 1 particle goes to the other side. And a toppling occurs here, then 3 particles leave and 1 particle goes to the other side. And that is all there is. So, now, all the matrices, there are only two of them, A1 and A2. Okay, so, you write down the matrices A1, A2, write down the algebra for, I think it goes like this, A1 to the power 4 is equal to A2, A2 to the power 4 equal to A1, as simple as this. Okay, and then uh, what is the corresponding group? That is the question. You figure out, you know, it is not a big deal, but you figure, work out the group, see what you can say about the group generated by these two generators with this algebra. Of course, if you are very ambitious, you can change the um, group, take three sides and do the same thing. Uh, this question number three is a little bit harder. Uh, it's not harder mathematically, but conceptually there is a little bit of a subtlety there, which I will, of course, want you to figure out. So the answer is not being given now. So I take a um, problem like this, one, two, three, four, there are four sides. But again, the rules are the same. You topple, drop four particles, one to each neighbor, at each side two leave. So now the operator algebra is like a1 to the power 4 is equal to a2 a4, a2 to the power 4 is equal to a1 a3 and a3 to the power 4 is equal to a2 a4 and uh, a4 to the power 4 is equal to a1 a3. So, I can write these matrices, these are, I guess, not so easy to write, these are supposed to be 4 to the power 4 dimensional matrices, right? That is not so easy. I do not want you to actually write them. <laughs> Imagine that you have written this 256 by 256 matrix, then you can still construct the group corresponding to this and what can you say about the group? So, the question is that subgroup generated by operators A1, A3. Suppose I only have these two generators A1, A3 and I keep on using them, then what is the group I will get? Will it be the full group or will it be less? The answer is clear. You know, you have this thing, you can only add here or here. So, if you start with a symmetric structure, you will remain on a symmetric structure. Okay? So, that is some kind of a subgroup of the group you will have to encounter. Okay? And the idea is to figure out what exactly is the subgroup here and, um, you know, what can one say about it. Okay, I think we will stop here now, even though I have 10 more minutes. Yes, sir. Sorry, uh, can you speak louder, please? Please, can you be quiet? Yeah. Yes. 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 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually, the firstly, I had tried to explain in the first lecture the motivation for doing all these problems. We want to address the experimental systems, the systems we observe in nature, you know, like coastlines, whatever. Then we make some models about these. The models are necessarily a little bit simplified because if you take a too complicated a model, you cannot do anything with it. The advantage of having a simple model is that you can analyze it, you can understand something about it. Some of the properties of the model will be shared by the actual experimental system. Some other properties will be specific to the fact that you have chosen a simple model. I think that is not a bad thing. You know, there is a statement by Einstein which said that you should make things as simple as possible, but not simpler. And when Einstein says something, most people nod their head, of course, you know, that he cannot be wrong. But in this case, I think he is not fully right. In some systems, it is necessary to make further approximation. You cannot describe it in the most complete way. Some simplification is necessary in order to understand complex systems. Okay? So we simplify further. We say, oh, let us consider the kinds of sand piles, but with this extra property, which is called the abelian property. Then it helps us analyze the problem. You take some other sand pile, I will not be able to find the steady state vector. Okay? So th using the fact that you have some special property, you get some results, which help us understand the original problem in some way. However, it turns out that you can actually preserve the abelian property even for Mm, so what is called stochastic sand piles. So we can get there and you know, it, it's not way out of place. Maybe this model is too simple, but slightly more complicated models can still be handled analytically or they can be understood in some way. And so that is what we would like to do. Okay. Other questions, complaints? No? Okay, then let's stop here.